Welcome to the Little Bit of Life podcast. I'm your host, Tabitha, better known as Little. You may think you know me from social media, but Little is shown off the apps. That's until now. This podcast is dedicated to having those real, raw, and occasional chats together about what we seem to think but don't say. Special guests will join me that have impacted me along the way. Nothing is off limits. Sit back, take time for yourself. You've earned it. And enjoy today's topic. One voice, one story at a time. Let's dive in together. Welcome in a little bit of life podcast right here with your host little today we have on an amazing guest you have seen her everywhere from general hospital days of our lives and maybe you've even seen her with the foster care reform system that is working for change. We have on the one the only Jen Lilly. How are you? It's good to see you. It's so good to see you. I'm so good and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. You have been busy. Busy is an understatement. How do you do? Yes. That's my first question diving in. How do you handle being a wife and a mother and an actress and a producer doing everything? How do you fit it all on your plate? Um, yeah, you know, I think that's a, it's a multifaceted answer. One for me, um, and I'll preface by saying, you know, anything I say is from my perspective. So I'm in no way trying to convince people of my perspective. Um, but because you're asking me, I think the way I deal with it first and foremost is prayer. I pray a lot. Mm -hmm. um a lot a lot i think that centers you or i think it calms you um and i think it it empowers you and equips you um but also you know i i'm an a-type personality and i'm hyper organized and so i follow this kind of um method that i don't know if there's an official term for it but it's often referred to as swallowing the frog so highly mm -hmm. productive people kind of swallow the frog first. So when you have like horrible to-do list, you you often try to uh, tackle the one you don't want to do first instead of putting it off. So it's yep. kind of the same concept of like eating dessert. It's like reward yourself. Eat your vegetables first if you don't like vegetables. <laughs> so yeah, I, I try to swallow the frog first, uh, which is awful, but it does. Then then you get excited about the things that are left on your list that, you know, mm -hmm. maybe are more fun. Mm -hmm. We have seen you, like I said in the intro, we have seen you all over our TV screen. What was it like being on all of the amazing shows that you've been a part of, especially being a female in Hollywood? I think there is such a stigma on women in regards to acting, but that you can still have it all. You can have the private family life, which I love that you have. But you're also an Thank actress you. at the same time, and you're really showing everybody what you want them to see when you feel that they need to see it. Thanks. I think that's hard to balance. Um, and I think social media is, is actually really hard for me because I do think it's hard to be present in your kids' lives and in your relationships with other people. Um, and then at the same time, you still need to be part of it. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I was just go, I told you earlier, I was just, I went to Phoenix to, I flew out there to celebrate the founders of Child Help's 90th birthday. I wasn't going to miss that, but it was funny because I was on the plane and they're like, oh, I should probably upload that, you know, I'm, we're heading to Phoenix. And I had to re-download Instagram because my iCloud had uploaded it off, which I was very proud of. And at the same time, like, Jen, you got to do better. So I'm not <laughs> the best at balancing it. I think it's hard because especially with like my generation, it was shifting from being very private and my family raised me very private of, you know, be proud of what's in your four walls and, you know, just be really proud of who you are internally and stay humble. And I think it's that hard balance of social media. You're having to show things and have people be a part of your journey, but still keep it in a humble aspect. And again, still keep your life private. So is that something yeah. that you feel is something where you're kind of shifting because obviously you have been in Hollywood for years and you're such an amazing asset. Do you feel that's been really hard in kind of shifting from the acting to the producing to now with all the advocacy work you do? Um, yeah, I think social media is just really tricky to uh, navigate. And I, I do think it's tricky. You know, I am the same way as you. I also really love people. You know, that's one of the reasons I got involved in acting is because I think people's stories are worth telling. And I think that when you tell people's stories well, 
It opens up people to maybe tear down judgments or preconceived myths or notions that they held in their hand and held in their hearts toward people. And so I think social media, I mean, we know social media can be so damaging. And I try not to add to that damage of, you know, this is a perfectly curated life or I'm always wearing makeup or, you know, whatever. But at the same time, there's kind of an expectation in Hollywood to, to, you know, falsely present yourself as having it all together and, you know, making yourself look important so that you're hireable and you're like a highly sought after commodity. And, Mm -hmm. and I think that's a tricky thing to straddle where it's like, I refuse, I refuse to make people feel less than, and if I do, it's not my intention, you know? Uh Um, So yeah, it's, it's tricky. When you were younger did you want to be an actress was that something I mean it's so many people always wonder like is this like her dream was this her goal no that's what's so interesting I think I was always interested in acting in the way that like my son Jeffrey is is really animated and he is very funny and you can tell that he's a ham because you can tell that he likes to make people laugh and in the same way I don't know whether I'm an extroverted introvert and an introverted extrovert. Like I, I, I actually am stage fright. So that's one of the reasons I wasn't an actor. Like theater scares the bejesus out of me. <laughs> um, camera though, it seems very much, it's much more intimate. It's kind of, or at least these are the lies I tell myself that, you know, I don't have an audience, even though through the lens and through the edit, I know that millions of people are going to see this in the moment you can just be lost in the other actor's performance. And it's really only the other actor and the director who are paying attention to your performance because hair is paying attention to your hair, thank God, and makeup's paying attention to your makeup or, you know, the zits that you have and not <laughs> making sure that they stay covered. So you don't really have an audience. But, um, but like my son, Jeff, I love when I'm in a small group, like I do like being funny. I enjoy and I feed off of being able to make people laugh. So in that way, I've kind of always been a natural performer. But at the same time, if you put me like up on stage or if I'm not afraid of public speaking, but if I'm invited to speak, you know, I'm sweating. So no, I didn't know I wanted to be an actor. And I also, um, you know, I grew up in in Roanoke, Virginia, which is not the lost colony. And people are like, oh, Roanoke, I've heard of Roanoke. I'm like, no, you've heard of Roanoke, the lost colony that lost. Um, you've probably not heard of Roanoke, Virginia. And I think that it's probably common in small town, at least small town America, which I love so much because that's where I'm from. Mm -hmm. But theater kids are weird. You know, theater kids are dramatic. And so I remember in high school doing Annie my senior year. I was like, okay, maybe I'll just try this on for size. Um, And I auditioned and uh, I had kept going back for the role of Annie, but they luckily gave it to a girl who had done theater her whole life, who deserved it because it was like, it meant so much to her. Mm-hmm. But I remember I, I played like Kate, which was some, you know, orphan, like one role. And I remember, you know, I'm a bit older. I turned 40 this year. So this is 2003 is when I was a senior in high school, 2002 to 2003. And I remember coming in, she's in the spring of 2003 to the auditorium and everybody's sobbing. And I remember being like, oh my gosh, was there another terrorist attack, right? Because we lived through September Mm -hmm. 11th Mm -hmm. and that was awful. Like we didn't have cell phones. It was like, you just prayed to God that in the next period or class that you went to, your teacher was like, hey, this is serious and had the TV on or that your parent was going to pick you up. I mean, so when I come in, it's that same kind of heavy atmosphere. And I remember being like, I remember sliding in to somebody like next to me and whispering to somebody like, (laughs) Because I was like, oh, my God, I don't know what's going on. Everybody's crying. Like, we must have had a terrorist attack or somebody must have died. Like, this is terrible. And the person was like, it's out of fire. And I was like, it's your blood. So, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I will see you in biology in 20 minutes. Like, so I was like, acting's not for me. You know, like, this is too much. This is next level. Like, I cannot handle these people. Like, this is not the life I, like, that is not who I am. Um, even though I'm animated, I am like, no, I don't want to gossip. Like, you know, people are like, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, as a producer, people are always like, what about whatever so-and-so mm-hmm. actor? And I'm like, 
I don't, what I am not about people's business. I'm in my own business. I stay in my own lane. So like, I didn't think acting was for me, but in college, um, I auditioned for an open film called The Loss of Life. And I ended up booking this email lead and I got on set. And I, again, I was just like, wow, these people who are in film just tend to be really creative people with an artistic eye and a love for storytelling. But when the camera cuts, like they're just normal people. So it was, uh, uh, that's how I kind of got introduced and fell in love with it. It's made so many people that have seen you on screen and on camera. You are always relatable in Thank all you. of the roles that you play. It seems like the person you are on camera, you, you take it very serious and you're very in depth. And a lot of your characters are very humble and heartfelt. You really connect with those characters. But I love watching you separately. And it sounds so perfect. Like, oh, I love watching you. But like your social media, you just seem so humble, that family close feel. Which brings oh my me gosh. to Thank my you. question okay. of you became a foster parent in 2016. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it is such an amazing topic to talk about because so many families, especially when you are in, you know, in Hollywood and you're and you're almost on this pedestal. It's this picture perfect perfection of a family. And you took that and you completely spun it of, this is what my love is. This is where my heart is. This is my calling. And you're making a change for other families and actually the whole system. So what brought you into being interested in being a foster parent in the first oh place? Oh, my gosh. Well, like, like, don't cry. First of all, thank you. That's a really sweet, um, gosh, that's like a really moving and sweet assessment and really, really moves me that that is um the aftermath of of my decision because that's what I hoped for um you know again it's a really layered answer so hopefully I can answer it and uh take you and everybody else who will end up listening on a journey that makes sense because I know <laughs> I can be kind of like like a girl and that we're like oh but going back to this so let me try to make this organized in my heart and in my answer um I think, first of all, you know, there's a scripture uh, that's really special to me. It's one of my favorite scriptures, and it's James, uh, I believe it's 127, and it says, pure religion. Now, I don't mean organized religion. I don't mean, uh, I, I don't mean like rules and rituals and, and rote memorizations that, that maybe you can repeat, but they're not in your heart. Uh, mm -hmm. That is not, that is worthless religion. And, and I obviously am a Christian and I, I, I mean, Jesus, like, if you really study Jesus and a lot of people don't know this, the only people he ever fought with were religious people because he would say like, you are a whitewashed tomb, meaning you might have it all clean on the outside and appear like, you know, you know it all and you've got it all together, but like you are a dead tomb like you are full of dead bones and cobwebs like you don't have a heart posture that I recognize and so knowing that that's kind of the back context of this verse it says true religion before the father is this to take care of widows and orphans in their distress and to remain unstained by the world and I love that verse because it it's like I think there are widows but also in modern day culture, I think widows are single moms mm -hmm. and I think single moms are heroes. And I just have a heart for that. And because it's the father's heart, like that is Jesus's heart. Jesus's heart is toward brokenness and toward people that are marginalized and put, put on the sidelines that people just ignore because it's too ugly and they don't. But like, if you look at Jesus, like he ran toward brokenness. Like he didn't run away. And then the second part to remain unstained from the world is not this poo-poo attitude of like, we're so much better than you because we know Jesus. No, that is not the correct heart posture. If someone really has Jesus in their heart, they are not a religious whitewashed tomb. Being unstained by the world means being uninfluenced and unimpacted by culture and society that tells you to embrace comfort and convenience. And so, that's the forefront of what got me interested in foster care. But in just a, you know, more practical life experience way, my parents were kind of unofficial foster parents. They, my mom was a, 
director of a women and children's charity um, call, and for unwanted pregnancies, um, because that's a reality for a lot of women, you know, mm -hmm. like pregnancy is hard. Being a mom is hard and not everybody's ready for it. Um, and I recognize that and, and I'm not here to speak to that, but there, my mom worked at a charity where it just let women know that there are options to how they want to handle that situation in a, an unplanned or unwanted pregnancy. And I think that foster care and adoption is very much an option that people don't know about. Exactly. Uh, and so because my mom was a director of a women and children's charity and my dad was a judge, they couldn't be f former fos formal foster parents because, because to be a foster parent, you're required by law to remain unbiased. The goal of foster care that a lot of people don't know it's actually put those families back together to reunify them. So the goal of foster care is not adoption. The goal of foster care is to heal that family unit, have that parent understand, you know, that maybe their choices or their circumstances um, are harming that child and, and, and wrapping around them to get them help so that they can put the family back together. Now, foster care is broken. So that's, that's, not always what happens. And I think in the few times that happens, I think that uh, foster care can be weaponized. And I think that the, the parents who find themselves in that circumstance uh, often feel like public enemy number one. But I will tell you, um, and I can't remember the statistic off of my head, but I can tell you that the overwhelming majority of, of children in foster care are in there because of neglect, not abuse. Mm -hmm. And it's normally poverty related neglect. So there's an amazing, um, there's an amazing movie called Sound of Hope that just came out that I just highly encourage everybody to see. It's based on a true story. It's incredible. It's incredibly acted, shot, edited. The musical score is amazing. The wardrobe is amazing. It's, it's a true story. It's so uplifting and inspiring. It's raw. It's real. It's gritty. It's amazing. I cannot, and I'm not in it, but I mean, it is, <laughs> that is such a good representation of, of what foster care really is. Um, but but it was also supporting a charity called Care Portal, and Care Portal is this incredible nonprofit that's kind of like uh, the Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace for foster care. So it's like, hey, this mom is going to lose her child because that child is sleeping on the floor. And what the government will do, because the government, and I don't mean the I don't I don't mean I mean the government as a system. I don't mean the individual workers. I mean there is a system that is set up that 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 forces social workers or people who are involved in the system to operate by a set of procedures that maybe transcend human logic and, and maybe what might be better, might be a better way of approaching it. And so instead of being like, hey, it cost us $150 to buy this child a mattress. But, you know, maybe we for $200 you can get a mattress and a bed and keep that family together. That's mm -hmm. what human logic would say. That's what Care Portal says. The government will just be like, no, let's remove the child and then pay some foster parent, you know, $500 or $800 a month stipend for months on end and and get this child in this system that's broken and horrible and awful to navigate uh, instead of just being like hey guys instead of spending that much money why don't you just spend two hundred dollars and invest in wraparound services for that family so what care portal does is it says um it's it's christian oriented so it, it reaches out to faith-based organizations you do not have to be a christian church in order to participate in care portal that's just kind of the trend because that's how it was set up but it's basically a, a, a church system can say, hey, we'd love to wrap around these moms. We would love to get that kind of Craigslist or Facebook marketplace notice that there's a mom in our area or there's a dad in our area. I recognize that single dadding is a thing too, um, but it's generally the moms. That's just kind of the general trend. Hey, mm -hmm. there's a mom in our area whose children are at risk of entering foster care because that mom needs a bed. And why? Not because the mom's a bad mom, she lost her job. Like we're in a recession, you know, she lost her job. She can't afford grocery. So as a faith-based community, why don't you do the will of the father, practice pure religion, put on your big boy pants and, and you know, big girl panties and, and get that mom some groceries and a bed and flipping, invite them to church and wrap around them. If we did that, the whole system would change. So mm -hmm. in a nutshell, that's how I got foster care. Again, 
you, I, you can see that I could just keep going. I'm very passionate about it. And hopefully that was not that long winded of an answer. No, that's how, that's how our followers and listeners are anyway. They're like, we, we, we kind of go, we ebb and flow. We, we kind of go in and out cool. of different topics. <laughs> I think it's because we have seen the worst of the worst when it comes to the perception and the reflection of foster care, mm-hmm. the system. It's it's Absolutely. so difficult. And obviously with being in a recession, it's something where it's not because most often a mother does not have that love for her child. Mm-hmm. She is overworked. She's working three jobs just to even pay to have a roof over her head. It's not what's under the roof. It's just to have a place to stay. And it's so difficult because I think as society, we turn our heads, right? If it's not happening within our family or someone we deeply know and we're close with, then we turn a blind eye. And also, I think it's such a huge concern of miseducation in the foster care system because, we, like I said, we've seen all of the terrible issues of this family had multiple children that they were, you know, getting that stipend for and they weren't taking care of the children. There was neglect because that's obviously come to light, especially most recent in the past couple of years. And it's heartbreaking. Because mm-hmm. I feel that foster care is looked at as a negative choice, as a last resort, mm-hmm. which definitely brings me to the next topic. You became a foster parent and then you adopted in 2019. That would totally be my experience. I would fall in love. I would get attached. I'd be like, this is my calling. So what would you give advice to someone who's interested in the foster care system, but may be uneducated of what the next steps are to do foster to adopt as an option? Um, loaded question. Okay, let me let me just write that down so, so that I make sure I get back to it. So what are the steps to foster to adopt, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, amazing. So I want to zoom back for a second about something that we just talked about um, with a myth and misconception of foster care. You know, foster care is also a cycle. So when you understand that, it allows you as a foster parent, your role is to remain unbiased. The goal of foster care, again, is to put these kids back with their family. And so, which incredibly emotionally, spiritually, mentally, even physically draining um, to try to remain unbiased because you step into the role of protector. And as I used to say to the boy's mom, you know, I love you, but my primary role is to protect these children. And sometimes I have to protect your kids from your Mm -hmm. bad decisions. Brutal. I was like, I don't write these reports, you know, gleefully. Like love does not gloat. Love love doesn't rejoice in in wrongdoing or, or... being better than somebody. And so I think that, um, so people need to understand that, that foster care is a cycle because when you understand that it's a cycle and that this parent more times than not overwhelmingly, like probably 90 plus percent of the time. Now don't quote me on that, but I believe that that's, I mean, it is overwhelming majority of -hmm. people whose children are in foster care also experience foster care themselves. So you're looking at a parent who, again, like you said, I mean, the problem is under their roof, but it's not by choice. And that's what you said. And that's true. Like foster care is not a choice. Foster care, there's a myth in foster care that these are bad kids. Children in foster care are not in foster care because of a decision that they made. They're in foster care because of a decision that somebody else made. So... If you want to get involved in foster care to adopt, if that's your goal from the outset, then I would tell you that you need to know that there are 29% of the kids in foster care. There are over 100,000 children right now in the United States on any given day that are awaiting adoption. They've already experienced something that's called TPR, which is Termination of Parental Rights. it's really a gross sounding term, but legally they have been emancipated. As in, mm-hmm. yes, they were like a slave to the system. They are now free, legally free and cleared. They have no parent. They are legally an orphan and they are available for adoption. If that is something you're interested in, I would highly encourage you to do that. I also want you, though, you have to watch Sound of Hope before you do that because. A lot of people also adopt and then think these kids are returnable. Mm-hmm. And 
technically they're returnable. Technically, you can take a child back to a social worker and say, I don't want this child. But if you do that, you're causing irreparable harm to that child. I mean, that child's better off just floating through the system and aging out than being adopted and then rejected by the people who said that they would be their forever family. So I would say there are over 100,000 children that are available for adoption. That is awesome. There are incredible organizations like the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, uh, which is the same as Dave Thomas who started Wendy's. Wendy's was adopted. Wendy was adopted. Um, he's very passionate about that. There are amazing organizations that do that. So if you want to get involved in foster care in order to adopt, there are definitely ways to do that. But you need to know what you're getting into because, you know, even my boys, I got them at four months each, uh, old each. Uh, they do happen to be half biological brothers. They have the same mom. They came with baggage, even at four months old. I mean, mm -hmm. you experience trauma in utero, you know, you experience trauma in the first Four months of their lives and while they might not remember what happened to them trauma is trauma and it, it in it so you are dealing with tr traumatized children but uh love can heal them you know and and so i would encourage people to do that now with my journey man it was an absolute honor and delight and relief a relief beyond words that i was able to adopt them but that was not the goal so in 29% of the cases, these children that have, again, the 100,000 children that are available for adoption are because they did have to go through something called termination of parental rights. In order to get to termination of parental rights, I mean, the good thing is, as of now in this country, and maybe this will change, and I hope to God it doesn't, parents need to speak up and, and reclaim our rights as parents. But as of right now, this country is a very, parents have a lot of rights that we are not always utilizing. Um, so you don't just get your parental rights strict willy-nilly. It takes years. It can take years um, and court case after court case because there's a liability, there's a legal liability that the states, that the, the, the cities, the states, and the federal government have to these parents to exhaust every resource and every chance. So going through those chances and having to go court case to court case to court case, knowing that if this child reunites with this parent, they are likely to die. Like that's the case for these kids. So my son, Caden, there's no way he would be alive right now if we had not adopted him. So the level of stress that you get to by the point of like adoption cases, like I am telling you, there is nothing more wearying and exhausting mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, and even physically than going through foster care. And at the same time, I would do it again and again and again. Like, I hope to foster again um, because it also is the most freeing thing, especially as a person of faith. Um, I don't know how many people will watch this over video, so I will explain to you what I'm doing with my fist. But I'm a very A-type personality. That's how we started this interview. I am a goal accomplisher. I set goals and I take goals and I make them happen. Um, so what I'm doing, if you can't see me, is I have my two fists up and my rigid little fingernails are digging into the palms of my hands because my fists are so tight. This is a picture of who Jen Lily was. Should, <laughs> even if she wants to be fun, but even in her fun Jen Lily, I am tight gripped. I'm a control freak. I am Monica and friends in every way. Okay. <laughs> Foster care is like prying open your hands finger by finger until your palms are face up in a posture of surrender. And I, I've just written a book. It hasn't been published yet um, with Dr. John DeGarmo, who's an incredible leading foster care expert and child abuse expert in the United States. And we're, we wrote a book on how to become a foster parent. So like I discussed this in my book. This is like my intro to my book. I'm explaining myself to people. But people think that the posture of surrender is having your hands up in like a don't shoot me way. We think that's surrender. That's not surrender. That's a don't kill me posture. Surrender is having your hands open toward heaven and saying to God or whatever you believe in, you have the ability to put anything in my hands and to take anything from my hands because I recognize that I am not in control. So foster care and the process of going through adoption hoping that my children would be able to be adopted so wouldn't be dead 
is 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 an exercise of faith and strengthening that I would not trade because now like going through the pandemic, going through a recession, going through whatever, it's like I actually live at a lot of peace that I had to walk out. I mean, faith and your faith walk is a refining process and you know, gold when it's refined by fire, which is like a scripture that's often repeated in the Bible. But if you just look at like the scientific process of refining gold, when you turn up the heat, it's the impurities that rise to the surface. So if the sea money lights, like if somebody's a parent and they're listening and they're, it's like, you don't even have to go through adoption. <laughs> if you're a parent, you're like, why am I angry? Like, <laughs> why am I mad at these kids? I have never been an angry or frustrated person. And yet here I am. Children turn up the heat. And it's like they bring to the surface, they refine you, they bring to the surface impurities that were deep down and you're like, I've never been an angry person. Oh, yes, you were. You just did not. Like it was in there. And uh -huh. so foster care is a way to bring impurities to the surface to allow like God to take them out of you. And so foster care has caused me to be a person that's a lot more chill and a lot more um, able to like really anchor and hold on to perfect peace um, and just know that like God loves these kids more than I do. And he's with me and helping me navigate, you know, things I don't want to navigate. Like I don't want to navigate adoption. My boys don't realize that they have a biological father and mm -hmm. they're about to, because my husband and I are like, we're going to have to give them the sex talk pretty soon. And I talked to my husband about that last night. I was like, this is going to be brutal because you have to understand they already know I didn't carry them in my belly. I had to explain that to them when I was pregnant with the girls. They don't understand you're not their dad biologically yes. um that's gonna be a messy thing to navigate but i know we can navigate it because we navigated foster care so mm -hmm. there's so many different parts of foster care we talk about mental health a lot on this podcast and you've lobbied with congress to talk about mental health of the children and i think it's interesting in our conversation because i don't think the mental health aspect is even considered in foster care with the foster parents. I mean, it's something I never even considered when you were talking about, you know, I have to protect these children. You become that protective role. You become a step in mother and you love these children because of the trauma they went through or because of the position they've been put in. Like you said, they didn't choose this. They've been placed there. How do you navigate that mental health aspect for yourself? Because you are, you can't, put guilt or blame on that parent. But like you said, they are trying everything to keep their child or to have a great outcome where they remain a family. But you're also on that outside perspective, seeing in of like, this was done wrong, this was done wrong, and you see what could happen at the end goal. How do you keep your mental health in a healthy space to advocate for the child, not be against the biological parent, but still kind of keep your sanity all in one time? I mean, and this is the answer that like, it's not a cop out. It's a lifestyle for me, but I truly mean this. I don't know how somebody could go through foster care or mm -hmm. much less life without Jesus. Like for me, it's prayer and it's faith and a God who loves me and forgave me in my mess. Like Isaiah 55. I mean, so for me, it's like repeating scripture, but there's two that come to mind. It's this is repeated twice. And, and when something's repeated twice, that's usually God saying like, it's like an emphasis. And in Hebrew culture, when you repeat something twice, it's, they don't have exclamation points. They just repeat it twice for emphasis. That's, that's what their culture does. Isaiah 55 and Psalm 103, there's a phrase that people throw around, you know, as if it's like an excuse for like not understanding what's going on in life. People have heard, whether they're faith-based or not, they've probably heard this expression, well, God's ways are higher than my ways, you know, like, uh -huh. like, I don't understand, like, God's ways are higher. And it's like, yes, God's ways are higher, but context is everything. If you look at Isaiah 55 and Psalm 103, the context of saying that God's ways are higher than my way and his thoughts are higher than my thoughts is rooted in God's mercy. So it's a setup that it's like anybody who has been like evil their whole life. And I don't just mean, I don't mean evil in a way like you don't know Jesus or something, you know, I mean evil, like murderous, like a willful child abuser. 
a pedophile. I mean, evil. You feel like God is saying, like, if you are evil, if you still have breath and you come to me with fear, like in reverence for who I am, I will freely love you and I will freely forgive you because my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I am not a man or a woman that would say that person deserves punishment and death because that feels just to us. And in a lot mm-hmm. of ways, it is just. I mean, God is a just God, but he is so much more able than us. Like that is the context of that phrase. My ways are higher than your ways. Whose thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Like he can extend love and mercy. And because he does that, we are called to do that. And so it's like, I, and so again, to answer your question, like the only way I can get through it is my faith and remembering that like God forgave me and I didn't deserve it. There, I can never be so, that is my basis of my faith. I am not good enough to get into heaven. It is the mercy of Jesus whose blood he and his death paid for the death that I deserved because I am not good enough to stand in God's presence. So again, like I'm not trying to proxylize to people. Like I am not trying to preach. That is what I believe. And that is the only way I got through it. And I have zero advice for anybody that like decent because I'm like, I don't know how you get through it without saying, I don't know. You're so passionate about this topic. And that's why we have you on because you lobbied for Congress and you're really advocating and being the voice for children that their parents may not know how to speak up for them. They may not know the direction to take. And even foster parents, they may be new to the system and they don't know how to advocate correctly. They just follow what they've learned. And there's a lot of miseducation. You're mm-hmm. really working on stopping premature reunification. Yes. And that topic is something that has to be educated because so many people look at a foster care system, right? And we think, well, that's the biological parent. They should be with that parent. The big question I always ask people, okay, but what about safety, mental health, and the safety of the child going back? And that's something that we never consider. It's always just right. Well, it's the biological family. They deserve it. They've earned it. That's their right. (laughs) And I love what you're doing in really educating people on what premature reunification really means and why it's so detrimental in the foster care system. Yeah. And I think it's also... It also encompasses the the parents' mental health because, and this is one of my big points in premature reunification. So just to break that down for the listener, what that means, reunification, you know, break down the term. It means reunifying, putting that child back together with the parent, premature before they're ready. So if you put that child, take them that child out of the foster parent's home uh, and put them back with their parent or family member that... Uh, biologically might deserve them before either person is ready you are it's a formula for failure mm-hmm. so many times over 30 percent of the times those children re-enter care again with more trauma more mental health issues more abuse again most most children when they enter foster care they think it's their fault that myth and misconception is not just from outsiders the child also is like what did i do wrong that i lost my parent so when you put reunification too early, it's, it's not only hard on the child. It's not only hard on the foster parent. The foster parent like, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to foster anymore because this parent wasn't ready. And now like this mm-hmm. child's with this abuser and like I have no control. It traumatizes the foster parent. It traumatizes the child in foster care. But it also is very unfair to that parent because again, like I said, earlier, if you're a parent, you understand children are unlocked. Like, it is a lot to get your own crap together and then also have to make dinner and do laundry mm-hmm. and bathe them and answer their annoying question. Like, why, why, why? And like their sass back and their attitude. And like, if I am exhausted, I don't have the resources. I don't have the money. And then I'm paired with a child who is wild and acting out. And I don't have the parenting skills to rein in my authority in a way that's not going to end up in me uh, kicking my child's butt. I mean, truly, mm-hmm. like, I don't care how loving and amazing I am. Don't think that as a mom, it doesn't cross. I mean, sometimes I have to leave the room. You know what I mean? Because you're like, I got to remember, I am the one in control and I am 40 years old and I am fighting with an eight-year-old right now. Like, I got to, I got to go to the lap. Like, I got to, because I want to flatten my child. Like, 
please don't act like if you're listening, Jen Lily's a horrible person. If you're a parent, <laughs> you know that there are moments where you're like, I'm gonna need to dead the breaths. <laughs> this is not good. So yep. if you and I, you know, and it's what you how you react that determines whether or not you're a good parent. And everybody's allowed grace. I have messed up as a mom. I think every mom and every parent has had moments we are not proud of. So I'm not saying there is not room to improve, but I think what determines if you're a good parent is is generally like how you're going to react to those moments. If you are not equipped as a parent to, if you don't have all your mess together and then you throw this child back in, you already have a r- abusive uh, history with and you have your own problems, maybe... Maybe you have a lot of times, you know, like, let's not be ignorant. A lot of times what's going on is there's domestic violence and there's also chemical dependence. There's a lot of drugs and alcohol going on with these parents. Um, Mm -hmm. And I am not looking down on that either. They're trying to fill a void. They're trying to escape the stress of life that they have. And if they've gotten themselves clean and then you reintroduce children, which are stressful, and having to immediately take on the full responsibility of parenting again it's probably going to drive them back to their addictions because they haven't had a long enough time to exercise their new coping skills so what i advocate for instead is let's not reunify prematurely let's instead create a system which exists in california and it doesn't exist in all 50 states and that's why i started lobbying because i was like listen california is a backwards on a lot of stuff well but their foster care system As jacked as it is, because it's foster care, you do a lot better job than a lot of other states, which is very interesting to me. And so I went to Congress as a bipartisan person and was just like, look, here's what California is doing that's great. Instead of just throwing that kid back into the deep end and the parents back into the deep end and ripping that foster parent's heart out, what we should do instead is what California does, which is, hey, how about we start with one night a week, just like custody? Can they do a sleepover? Great. That child just needs to endure those 12 hours. And if they come back to the foster parent or their therapist or their social worker and say, hey, while I was back at mom and dad's house, he raped me with a glass bottle. And these are things that happen. (laughs) Maybe that child should then back up a few more steps back to uh, monitored visits where they're not going to be alone with that parent. You know, maybe we would set in some safety parameters or... Like, on a positive note, they come back and they're like, it was great. And that parent knows, I just have to survive these 12 hours. And in the morning, uh-huh. they're going to go back to school and they're going to go back to their foster family. That helps that parent, like, dip their toe in and acclimate. Then it goes to two nights. Then it goes to weekend passes. And then you're slowly reunifying until that parent is ready, the child's ready, the foster parent is more ready. You know, it's just more fair for everybody. And it has a higher success rate of not putting these parents back in the system, burning out the foster parents and setting up these actual biological families for failure. I would never think to say on a podcast that California as a state as a whole is doing something that needs to be done across all states. I don't think I would ever in my right mind think that. But it's interesting because, I mean, I, my mom and I are super close and we always laugh. I always say, you know, in order to drive and be behind the wheel of a vehicle, you have to go through extensive driving tests. You have to That's sit right. next to a stranger and you have to do all these things. You don't have to do any form of test. You don't have to have anything in order to be a parent. And so when so many people think, you know, I failed as a parent and I can't take care of my child, you didn't fail. But it's also the system giving you the tools that you can learn. And then if you fail and you fall, guess what? You can get back up again. Yeah. I think it's interesting with your family dynamic. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, foster to adopt, never really a thing. So many people just, you know, the foster was the the outer family, right? It was, you can't take care of your child. We will take your child in and we'll take care of them. And then when you kind of get your life together, then we'll kind of revisit that. Then I feel like the foster care system really changed uh, because, again, it's the magnitude of the number, right? The magnitude of children that are in the foster care system. It's devastating. Absolutely mm-hmm. devastating. And I love the dynamic of your family because you're showing and even talking like we're about ready to have that conversation. It's not pretty. It's not easy. Just because you are a foster parent or you foster to adopt, there's still that different dynamic. They are your child and you have your own biological children. So you're a blended family. Mm-hmm. 
those conversations are going to come up. I'm sure those conversations have come up between your biological children and your children that are adopted. So I think it's beautiful Thank what you. you've done and blended. But I can't even begin to imagine if we have someone that's listening thinking, how do I have that conversation of, I didn't carry you, or that's not your biological father. How do you have those hard conversations to not only they feel loved, but you're telling them your experience of why they're there? I think it's really important. Um, well, before I say what I'm about to say, I'm going to preface by saying, listen, whenever somebody says like, you're a good mom or whatever, I'm always like, listen, hold that thought until my children are grown. If my children are well-adjusted humans who are kind to other people, who have a good work ethic, uh, who are honest and hopefully still like me, you know, and want to spend time with me, then you can tell me I'm a good mom. So the caveat is I am very much in the thick of it, still navigating this. Again, like I said, we're about to kind of have a little bit of sex talk with my boys because I think it's really important to beat the schools to that conversation oh, wow. um, and, to, and to posture yourself as a parent, as the expert. So <laughs> it's, it's going to get messy. But at the same time, I think it's really important specifically with foster care. Uh, and I think this is important in all adoption, but I think it's immensely important mm -hmm. in foster care to not prematurely, to not, and this is a parenting tip for in general, don't answer the question that you think they are asking. Make sure you understand what they are asking. So for example, my son Jeff two years ago He's Jeff's very in instinctive. And I think what he was maybe asking was about his biological dad. But I know he hasn't had that conversation. And I don't think people at four years old had had that conversation with him. But he's mm -hmm. very intuitive. And it's, I think that's what he was asking. So he said, well, where's my dad? I'm not going to say, oh, your dad that like was your sperm donor? Because that's all Jeff's dad was. Jeff's dad was a freaking sperm donor. That's it. He never even like met Jeff until it was too late. Anyway. Makes me mad as a mom. <laughs> I didn't say, oh, that dad. I just said, what do you mean? You know, like, what do you mean? Like, your daddy's right there. And he's like, no, my dad. And I, again, I'm like, what do you mean? Because you want to make sure, you know, they're asking for the question that they want. But at the same time, I think specifically adoption, getting back to what I was about to say, is that that is their story. And, and, and they're like, Kaden's not going to be ready. I don't think for his full story until he's an adult. His you story know. is so much worse than Jeff's. Jeff knows a little bit about his story, but Kaden's story, it's like, I don't know how I'm going to navigate that fully. It's brutal. But I think as a mom, what I do know is true. And I think it's really important for them to understand is like the woman who carried you in your belly really loved you. She mm -hmm. just didn't know how to be a mommy. Because she didn't have a mommy that took care of her. And that's what I'm trying to like just stress because I don't want them to think that they were rejected. Like that's not really what adoption is. I think ado adoption through foster care is harder because you are dealing with a parent that made really crappy decisions and it makes me want to cuss. You know, like, like, like <laughs> sometimes there's part of me that wants to be like, that part is a piece of crap. But like, again, that's why I'm like, I don't know how you do this outside of faith. That person deserves my mercy and my love because God gave me his mercy and love. So it's hard to balance. But like with adoption in general, that's a brave choice for that mom or dad to make. It is a brave choice to carry your child to term and then entrust that child with another family. So if somebody's making adoption as a choice from the get-go, that's a freaking brave choice. Pregnancy's mm -hmm. not easy. Birth is not easy. And then giving up that child that grew within you, not easy. Foster care, not easy either. Because even whether they wanted that child or not, like that child was stripped from them. It's, it's an ugly thing. And so I think it's important to let that child know, like that child was not personally rejected. That child did not do anything wrong. And I think it's also important to frame it in the sense that like, I chose them in a way. Like, God knew they were going to be in my family. But, like, I still had a choice to adopt them. 
Julie mm-hmm. and Jackie, my daughters, choose that. Jackie, thank God, she was a surprise, you know? <laughs> she was a massive surprise. And, and you know, praise God for it, but, like, that was not planned. The boys, like, I chose that. That's special. Um, so I think framing it in ways that, then you learn that. I, hopefully you learn that in your adoption and foster care classes is it's really important to structure it as an addition and not a subtraction. Because they've already lost their biological family, but they're gaining something, you know? (laughs) The boys technically have two moms that care about them. And theoretically, they have two dads that care about them. This may tell you, like, I chose them. To put that into a sentence when you look at a blended family, I think is so important. Because as society, we look at it, uh, they're different. They're different. And I love that you embrace them and they're all your children, which brings me to a question that I also don't think is really talked about in foster. When you are married and you have a spouse and you have a partner, how does that work in regards to your partner with support? Because your experience as a mother is different than your spouse as your partner's as a husband. How does that work in foster care when maybe you have a very strong calling for adoption or you have kind of the struggle of I'm their mother and I'm protecting? How has this affected your marriage? I think foster care is something you need to go into with the united front. And again, like open hands, willing to learn because it's just like parenting. You can you can take every class you want and then you're in it. You know, I mean, like when your kids annoy you you better have a lot of tools in your belt because, you know, in moments of of panic and the child, like, having a fit, you better have, like, 15 tools in your tool belt because I guarantee your brain's going to go blank and you got to latch on to at least one. And it's the same thing with foster care. Like, you you need to go in with a heart posture, again, that you're trying to reunify this family and you're trying to provide love and healing as a whole to the whole unit. Um, but I think people that are listening, you know, if they've, if they've been interested in, in foster care, like just be encouraged because I, I, in my journey have, have yet to meet a couple that both wanted to do it from get go. It's almost always one spouse. It's like, and surprise, surprise, I'm the one that was like, what? Oh, and my husband's like, you're crazy. You know, because he like 51% of surveyed Americans, he, he thought these kids are bad kids. Like you're you know, you're involved. You're like, you want to open our home to like hoodlums. And it's like, well, yeah, they might be like a lot of work. But at the same time, they're like that because of somebody else's choice. They're not bad kids. They've just been influenced by poor decisions and and a lack of love. Um, Real love. I don't mean love the emotion. I mean love that's consistent, love that has boundaries, love that heals, Um, not the emotion. Like, I think that parents can love their child and still make really bad decisions. You know, that's what mm-hmm. a lot of foster care is. You can have love toward a child and just be a terrible parent. So just know that I always say, to this is what I said to my husband. I said, you are 50% of this marriage. So you were allowed to say no to foster care. I can find way. You can find, you don't have to be a foster parent to get involved in foster care, mm-hmm. you know? Not everybody is called to be a foster parent. Everybody is called to these children. So, you know, you having me on your podcast, like you're doing your part. What is your gifting? Your gifting is having the podcast is one of your giftings. Yeah, I'm saying it's your only gifting, but like you are using your platform now to spread light. And because of this episode, maybe other people will become foster parents and you take part in that. You take part in the planting and the watering and the growing of the outcome of that child's lives because you had me on this podcast. Some child's life is going to be changed because of your willingness to have me on. And so it's the same. I would say, like, do what you can. What is your gifting? What is your ability? Are you a hairdresser? There are girls that have, and boys, you know, that have gone through foster care that have never had a haircut. These girls don't go to their homecoming or prom and feel pretty because no one's ever done their hair. Could you have a day before homecoming that you're like, listen, I know homecoming's coming up at the local high school. I'm going to have a day that where from this hour to this hour, if a child is in foster care, if a teen is in foster care, they can come and I will give them a haircut or a hairstyle, you know, a shampoo, whatever. Mm-hmm. You can use your gifting in the area that you are to make a difference. But if you want to become a foster parent and your spouse doesn't, I always say this, this is what I said to my husband. 
you are 50% of this marriage. You are allowed to say no. However, you are not allowed to say no to something when you do not know what you are saying no to. So mm -hmm. at the very least, we have to go to a foster care orientation class, find out what it's about, and chances are, because I'm an A-type control freak and I am literally Monica Keller, we're going to get into that class and I'm going to be like, I'm brother, and Chris, I'm a writer, I'm a producer, like, that goals, you know? I have time mm -hmm. to open up my home to crazy. And my husband's going to be the one that's like, oh, man, of course that's what happened, you know? But it's like, you just, just go take an orientation class. And if you're not ready for what foster care is, and just think about, like, the gifts that you have and, like, start utilizing them. Get involved in care portal. Like, give a bed every once in a while. Give somebody some groceries, you know? All right. All right. Well, I love having you on. Having Thank your you. passion shine through because when I posted that you were coming out, it was interesting because so many people, I love kind of giving you guys sneak peeks of what's coming up. And it was interesting because so many people are like, oh, I know her. I'm like, do you know her or do you know her on the screen? And everyone's like, wait, what do you mean? I'm like, do you know her? Do you know the dynamic? Do you know what she's passionate about? Do you know what she stands for when that camera turns off? Because even with social media, we all have a camera. We all have a platform. And it's how we're using it, what we're passionate about, the changes that we want to see and what we're called to stand up for and talk about. Foster care is not something a lot of people feel comfortable. One, they're not educated. Two, they don't even know how to start having those conversations. Good. Maybe they're interested in being a foster or in, they're not really sure if they're supported by their, you know, their family. If their family feels it's a poor choice. Huge. So very, very close friend of mine. She's. She's in her 50s and she's like, I want to be a foster mom. I can't, I've never been married and I have this calling to be a mom. And she's like, I'm not supported in this. There's so, a scene. There from, I'm looking up looking for what is this movie called? Oh, my gosh. What is this movie called? Uh, Instant Family. Yeah, there's a movie called Instant Family. And there's a scene in there where Ross Brand and uh, Mark Wahlberg have decided to foster. And they, they're at, he's given with their family and the family, they, they basically are like, we're not going to foster. And the family's like, oh, say God. Oh, and then, you know, and, and Russ, Br Rose Brand or whatever his character, then it's like, you know, we are going to foster. But like, I definitely experienced that too. Your family will mm -hmm. think you're insane for wanting to do foster care. Mm -hmm. Even when they kind of also did it. Like, so they're yeah. like, no, no, that's not for you though. You know? And I think that, I think when your family has that conversation with you or your friends tell you you're crazy. Again, back up and be like, well, why are they saying this? They're saying that because they love you and they know the road of pain that is in front of you. Mm -hmm. Foster care is messy and foster care is painful. And so as a friend or as a family member, their instinct is just to protect you. And, 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 and so you have to give them grace. Like, they don't know what they're talking about. They're just, it's a knee-jerk reaction doing, oh, I want to watch you go through that. And then when you start them on the adventure... Almost always, I see the whole family almost always eventually being like, this was a good thing. So, so just right. hang in there. That is the thing. So many people feel I'm going to get judged or what are people going to think? And I always, I always tell people, if you have a calling and you have a passion and it's just building inside of you, just go for it. Because there's always many people that, you know, like you said, they're like, what is wrong with you? What are you thinking? But it's the goal of you have made a difference. If you're listening, I'm going to put all of your information in the bio description. There's petitions out there. There's ways that you can help and there's yes. things that you can do. You don't have to open your home. Um, you don't have to do anything as much as, you know, these extravagant things. Maybe you just want to help. And a little bit goes a long way. So I absolutely adore you. I think what you're doing is so incredible and inspiring. Um, and I have to say kudos to you for getting through the hard times because they're still coming. It sounds like that sex talks is, is coming, but I absolutely adore you because you're putting to light a very sticky topic that Thank not you. a lot of people back you or support you. But I love that you are still a powerhouse of a female. You're an actress, you're a producer, you are doing it all. I mean, you, even when we scheduled this, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm doing a film and I'm going here and I'm going there. But you're also very rooted in your family and your family is blended and it's truly beautiful thing. Thank you so much for having me on. That's a wrap already on today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for spending your time right here with me. And a very special thank you to today's sponsor, 
We are stronger together, louder as one, and truly a family connected. Be sure to leave a review to bring others along this journey with us. Tune in weekly on your favorite streaming platform. Or if you're interested in being a guest, send me a message today. Let's get to talking. Until next time, be good to others, be good to you. See you next week.